these bags are full of food for the family. But what sort of food? Right, you two. Can you sort that lot out for me? Can we help? Sorting out the food tells us a bit about it, but it does have problems too. I haven't got very much. Neither have I. What can you think of another way to sort these things out then? Well, I'll do anything that's The problem with sorting out food like this is there are so many different kinds. Why do we have such a range of food? The children decide it's time for a proper investigation. Come on, let's go! investigators don't have far to go. The main street of their town is as good a place to start as any. Most of the people who fill the street are doing their shopping. Perhaps they're thinking about what they might buy for tea, or what they might want for a big meal at the weekend. There are shops for everything in a street like this. Clothes shops, shoe shops, video shops, and of course shops selling every sort of food. Fruit and vegetables, frozen food, bread, and meat. There are places where you can buy meals to take away with you. And places where you can eat out. We sometimes eat, not because we're hungry, but just because we like eating. Nonetheless, we need to eat food regularly to be healthy. But what should we buy? The food investigators are going to find out. There's lots of food to choose from here. What would our food investigators think if they had nothing but bread to eat? Would this be good for them? What about meat? Do we need all this meat to be healthy? What about crisps? All right, could we live on crisps? Do we really have any idea what's in the food we eat? Probably not. But that's what our food investigators are going to find out. And they start by looking at labels. Manufacturers like to give their food colourful labels. It helps to sell it. And a label tells us quite a lot about the food. It can tell us where the food comes from. Holland, France, Thailand, Portugal. But what does this actually mean? Did the Portuguese catch these fish or just put them in cans? There's a lot more on the label. We can find out what's in the food. Some of the information tells us about the energy and nutrients the food gives us. We need these to be healthy, and every food has different amounts. We also need to know how long the food will keep. But now our investigators are puzzled. There are no labels on this food. So what kind of information do we need? The food investigators have designed their own labels.
food labelling is actually a serious business and knowing how different foods help our bodies is important if we're to keep healthy. We need a variety of food because each has different amounts of energy and nutrients. Some foods have plenty of protein. Others have lots of carbohydrates or fat. Some foods have lots of fibre, which keeps our digestive system fit. Others have lots of vitamins and minerals. Do you know which minerals make healthy bones and blood? And by the way, did you know that we need to drink about two pints of liquid a day? That's a bit more than a litre. The investigators think they've made a good choice, so they're off to the checkout. They don't think much of her shopping. No fresh fruit, no vegetables, not much variety. Very unhealthy. Ladies and gentlemen, may I have your hats? Thank you. Can I take you to the table? The investigators have decided to treat themselves at a restaurant to find out more about food, of course. Grazie. Prego. Grazie. Thank you. Here we are. I hope you're going to choose a lovely Thank meal. Thank you. Yeah, we've got some lovely speciality. Thank you. And if I can be of any help, I shall help you any time. Thank you. What are you going to have? The soup is minestrone. And may I suggest you for afterwards the house pizza? Yes, yes please. please. What should we have for sweet? May I surprise you? What is the surprise? Sicilian cassata. Thank, Thank you. you. The investigators are pleased with their choice. They know what goes into pizzas and they like it. And the sweet course sounds exciting. But they're in for a surprise they didn't expect. Per lei, signorina Minestrone. <coughs> e per lei, signore, la pizza della casa. <laughs> There's a lot more to food than simply choosing what you like. A lot of food won't make a proper meal until it's been prepared. It has to be bought, cleaned, combined with other foods, cooked and presented attractively. Tony Russo has invited the investigators to explore his restaurant okay. and find out for themselves what's involved. You are inside my storeroom now, and this is what uh, is able to make um, whatever you added today to it. Uh, First, all the food has to be ordered. If it's fresh, like fruit, vegetables and meat, it's delivered every day. Otherwise it comes in cans, jars and packets, which keep it good to eat. There's plenty of pasta, because this is an Italian restaurant. There are lots of herbs and spices, and a huge jar of garlic in olive oil. There's an enormous freezer, which keeps the food good to eat for a long time. And then of course there are boxes of cakes and puddings, and a cellar full of wine. But ordering food is only the first stage. It needs to be prepared for the customers. Okay, you ladies and gentlemen, this is my kitchen, my private kitchen, where I usually do all my cooking. And as you notice, there is some fresh veg here, where I usually make my minestrone. And all this vegetables. All fresh fruit and vegetables are washed carefully before they're used for cooking. You need to be an expert chef to chop food like this. Tony uses the board only for preparing vegetables. A pan is already heating on the stove, and when the vegetables have been chopped finely enough, they're spooned in. Boiled for about an hour. The vegetables will be left to cook for about an hour. Tony is always careful to ensure that all his saucepans, dishes and cutlery are spotlessly clean before he uses them. He'll add more ingredients later on. But meanwhile, the dough for the pizza is being mixed in a big machine which he keeps down in the cellar. Again, the investigators saw how clean he keeps it. When the dough's had time to rise, he makes the pizza. Take a pizza from my little box, a dough, and we put on top of the table. 
and you make sure you're going to press it properly so all the hair goes out from inside you stretch it like you would stretch anything like a piece of rubber and you keep working in your hands until when it gets to the length of the pizza you require and as you notice it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger when the base is ready tony adds the ingredients then the pizza's ready for a hot oven meanwhile the soup has been cooking on the stove Tony's added salt and pepper and herbs and tasted it to see whether it's good and he thinks it's ready to serve. Buon appetito. To enjoy their pizzas, the investigators have abandoned knives and forks. But there's much more to food than just getting it ready and eating it. Because food is so important to us, we surround it with rituals and customs. Cassata siciliana. This is your surprise. Even the order of courses at a meal is fixed. We'd never begin with the sweet. Food is part of all the big occasions in our lives. In Scotland, they pipe a haggis in with a tune from the bagpipes. And in Japan, serving tea is a ritual. Food is at the heart of many religious ceremonies. <laughs> Jews commemorate the Passover with a meal in which each kind of food has special significance. And of course, when Christians take communion, they're remembering Christ's Last Supper, which was a Passover feast. Food is such an important part of life, it's not surprising that artists want to celebrate every aspect of it in paint. Feasting, cooking, and of course the actual things we eat. at these pictures we can see what a lot of different food people like Ugh. but we shouldn't be put off by food we're not used to where does all this food come from it doesn't grow in sacks and boxes. Most food comes from the land or the sea. We call this natural landscape, but over the centuries people have changed it, so it will produce the food we need. So what changes can the investigators see? At one time these hills would have been covered in trees, but when sheep were introduced, the trees were cleared. As time passed, most of the woods gradually disappeared, and later the hedges were taken out too. These walls wouldn't have been here if people hadn't wanted to mark off their own land to keep in the sheep and cattle.
If we hadn't needed food, there wouldn't have been farmhouses, barns, and well-cultivated fields. Machinery which reaps the harvest and plows the soil has changed our countryside. And the animals, cattle, sheep and pigs, have changed it too. Farming started in a simple way. A family could grow enough food for themselves on a small piece of land. At harvest time, they'd ask the neighbours to come and help. There are many places in the world where the land is farmed like that now. This kind of farming needs fairly simple implements. And if we go to a museum, we can see that until quite recently, before the invention of tractors, our farm machines were also quite simple. Some of these tools were drawn by horses, but quite a lot of them were made to be used by hand. This is a turnip knife. As you can see, it's got a really sharp blade on this side and a hook. And sometimes they're also sharpened on this side, although this one never has been. And they're quite light because someone had to use this all day. Sometimes the people used to eat the turnips when they were really poor, and sometimes the animals eat the turnips. And we feed our animals here on fodder beet, it's called. We have a huge machine which goes through the field, drags it all up, collects it in a big tractor, and then we bring it back in. You've probably seen it in big piles around the yard, and then it goes through machines to be cleaned and chopped. Simple farming tools are fine when there's only a family to feed. But when farmers began to grow food for villages and towns, then machinery became bigger and more complex. These machines were in use 30 years ago, but now they're out of date. Once upon a time, you'd bring home the harvest on a wagon like this. Now it's only a museum exhibit. It would never carry enough for a city full of hungry people. Today, the land must produce more and more food, and farming gets more and more complicated. There are many different sorts of farms. Some grow grain for bread. Some grow nothing but vegetables. This machine plants cabbages at exactly the right distance from each other. This farm grows cauliflowers, and there's even a machine specially designed to collect them. Some farms keep hens for their meat and eggs. Sometimes the hens can move about, but often they're kept in cages called batteries. Some farms have pigs. Some farms keep cows. And there are farms with a mixture of animals and crops. But in a way, they're all doing the same thing. They're using the land to grow the plants and animals we need for food. We only get the grains, fruit and vegetables that we need because plants get energy from the sun and nutrients and water from the soil. Then the animals get energy and nutrients from the food they eat. So we need to look after the land if it's to look after us. But that's not the end of the story. What about milk? We know it comes from the cow, but before it reaches us, there's a lot to be done. The investigators go to find out. The milk from the cows is stored by the farmer until it's collected each day in a big tanker. Then it goes to a central depot where it's pasteurised before bottling. And because we drink millions of gallons of milk each day, there are a lot of bottles. In other factories, flour is being made into bread. Vegetables are being turned into soup. And thousands of pieces of fish are being fried. All these foods are being prepared and packed, ready for us to eat and drink. 
and the milk is on its final journey to our doorstep. Thank you. 